Yeah, I'm pretty sure the game over blocks aren't supposed to look like that in the Tandy mode. I have to confess, I'm playing a less than legit copy because both of my legitimate discs don't seem to be working anymore. The five and a quarter inch one though did still work many filler videos ago, so you can at least check that out to see the game footage running on that old thing. Okay, so now that you all know what today's Ancient DOS game is, just from looking at it, the Spectrum Holobyte version of the Russian computer game, Tetris, I'm going to guess many of you are wondering how I could possibly make an entire episode focused on this game when pretty much everyone and their pets knows what this game is. Well, even though you may know what Tetris is, and you may know some of the details about its history and such, you may not be aware of some of the technical aspects which either go into making a Tetris game in general, or some of the curiosities with this specific version. But yeah, in the extraordinarily unlikely event you have no idea what Tetris is, it's basically a line clearing puzzle game where you drop blocks of varying configurations, and when you make a full line, it disappears. Interestingly enough, because Tetris was still very new when this version was released, a lot of the conventions players were taking for granted in versions as early as the NES port weren't actually present here. Now, that's another thing we're going to go over. Regardless of anything though, Tetris is one of the first games to truly capture the attention of not just gamers, but everyone. Even when I was a young kid in the late 80s when we actually bought this game for our Tandy 1000 computer, information about it had already swept like wildfire and everyone was talking about it. My father had actually played it so much back then, he himself experienced what's now known as the Tetris Effect where performing an activity, such as playing Tetris, for an extremely lengthy period of time affects your thoughts and dreams to reflect the activity. This is something gamers will know all too well, and for gamers, this isn't anything unheard of or seemingly special. But everyday people with no gaming interests were experiencing this, specifically thanks to Tetris, which is how the phenomena came to be named after this game. And this is what most of this episode is going to be about, it's exploring little tidbits like that as opposed to talking about the game itself, since, as I put it way back in my old filler video, it's Tetris. Now you could write an essay on all the companies and people involved in producing the innumerable versions of Tetris out there, so for the sake of this video, I'm going to focus specifically on the version I have which is the Spectrum Holobyte version released in 1987. Though I should mention, the original design work was done by Alexei Pajitnov and Vladimir Bakilko in 1984, with the original code having been written by Vadim Gerasimov. It's important to note that none of these people ever expected Tetris to become the massive success it did, and it wasn't until Pajitnov formed the Tetris Company in 1996 that the success of Tetris finally started to reach at least one of its original creators. Now, some people might call Tetris an action slash puzzle game, but I don't feel this is accurate enough since the main goal of the game is to score points, especially considering there's no multiplayer here. So it's more apt to call it a one player arcade slash puzzle game, so that players are aware that the main goal is to score points and not achieve any particular objectives. The Spectrum Holobyte release supports CGA 4 color, Tandy 16 color, and EGA 16 color graphics, all running at 320 by 200 resolution, but only supports the PC speaker for what extremely few sound effects are present. I should also mention that the only thing which sets apart the Tandy and EGA modes is a single background, which has been done to take advantage of the extra colors. And then the only thing which sets them both apart from the CGA mode is how they color their blocks. Otherwise, all three modes look virtually identical. As for its current release date, oh yeah, Tetris is still very much commercial, despite all the unofficial clones out there. Amazingly, finding copies of the original DOS version of this game isn't too difficult. It's not easy, but it's not nearly as hard as some games that have had countless releases. If you go searching specifically for the Spectrum Holobyte release of the game, you're sure to find some, either for DOS or for other computers. In terms of pricing, it's also not nearly as crazy as I'm used to seeing with things that you'd think would have become collector's pieces, with fully boxed copies only topping out around $60 and loose discs going for as little as 10 bucks. 
Now, for those of you wondering how such a super popular game could be so simple to find original copies of without the prices going through the roof, permit me to explain a very simple concept. Supply and demand. Games which were incredibly popular often have so many copies in circulation that people are willing to sniff out the best deals because so many are out there available to people. And this is why this version of Tetris isn't rare or ultra expensive. There's simply more than enough copies out there to satisfy the demands of collectors, and those people are willing to wait to find the best deals rather than snatch up the first copies they see. Do make sure you're getting the version you want though, as the DOS version is one of only several ports and variants of this specific release. Since I'm not going to be talking about the gameplay specifically, since I shouldn't have to for a game this ubiquitous, let's start by talking about some of the features that this game has, some of which you may not be familiar with or which may seem counterintuitive if you've played even just a slightly more advanced version. Firstly, you'll notice there's no next indicator. Sort of. There actually is, and you can turn it on and off with the simple push of a button. But in this version of Tetris, the next feature is disabled by default. Not only that, it's turned back off again every time you start a new game. Next, let's address dropping the pieces. Most Tetris players are probably used to the idea that when you hold the down arrow, the pieces simply drop faster. In this version of Tetris, and in fact in quite a number of versions, pressing the button to drop the pieces happens instantaneously, with no chance to move the piece following. This means if you want to horizontally slide one piece into a gap or such, you have to wait for it to make its way down. This actually ties in with the scoring, and is the only realistic way to score lots of points. See, here's something very unusual about this version of Tetris. You only score points for each piece dropped, not for the lines made. And furthermore, the points you earn are specifically based on what speed level you've reached and how long you take before you drop a piece. So basically, the faster you make your moves and the higher your current speed level, the more points you earn per piece. And that's the only factor in your score. Later versions of Tetris would instead award you the most points for making more lines at the same time, as making triples and quads is often very risky in comparison to just making lines as fast as possible. One other feature not often seen in Tetris variants is height replay. The speed level affects the background and the speed the pieces fall at, but you can also set a height, which determines how many layers of the game board are littered with junk pieces to clear away. Now in some versions of Tetris, including this one, is a replay feature, which allows you to play the exact same layout of junk that you just had. And I think because of how it affects the randomizer, it may even give you the same pseudo-random sequence of pieces as well, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, I'm calling them pieces, but the actual objects you're dropping are tetrominoes. Now much like how a domino is two squares attached to each other on their precise edge alignments, a tetromino is four squares attached in this manner. Now, if you allow the rotation of each of these, but not the flipping or mirroring of them, you're able to produce seven unique shapes. A square, a T-shape, a very long shape, and two others in two different mirroring states, often referred to as the L, J, S, and Z shapes. I'm still going to call them pieces, though. Another interesting thing is that this game doesn't have any ultimate limit, often referred to as Mode A or Type A gameplay and other variants. You play until you can't anymore. Now, as you can see, I myself was able to get quite far here. Another variant of gameplay referred to as Mode B or Type B is where you have a certain number of lines to clear to win a level, and then your score is applied separately to each combination of height and level when the scores are being tracked. One feature you definitely don't see a lot of anymore is the boss key. Pressing escape at any time in this game brings up a text mode boss screen which looks like a spreadsheet. Now, I've mentioned this before, but the idea of the boss key is to have a key which always functions, whereby if you're playing a game on company time and your boss walks in, you simply press this key and it looks like your computer screen has actual work-related stuff on it. Of course, this may not fool everyone, so Spectrum Holobyte went one step further and added a special version of Tetris called Resident Tetris into their release, which is a TSR program you can invoke with a simple key combination, and this allows you to play Tetris while any other program is running. The TSR stands for Terminate and Stay Resident, and is essentially the DOS equivalent of drivers and background programs. The way it works is TSRs would execute from the command prompt, deposit some dormant code into memory, 
and then terminate. The dormant code would then be triggered by a specific hardware or software interrupt, and it'd run for a moment before returning control to whatever caused the interrupt. Resident Tetris deposits code into memory, along with a single background, and it'll essentially run Tetris instantly through a key combination. You could then quit in an instant and return control back to whatever you were doing prior, and reactivate the game again later whenever you wanted to. The guys at Spectrum Holobyte clearly felt a boss key alone just wasn't going to cut it for this game. Now let me bring up a shot of these discs again, because there's something unusual about them. They say version 1.0, but they are in fact the second version released. I managed to source a copy of the first version and gave it a little bit of gameplay, and it's slightly different. Firstly, the plane in the intro sequence is missing. Secondly, the controls aren't as responsive. But the most notable change is the backgrounds, as the original version of the game has some different ones. Now, thanks to the power of high definition, here's a matrix of all 10 from each version, including a shot of the level selection screen since that's different too. You can pause the video if you want to take a closer look, but the main difference is, is that one decidedly Russian scene and a scene with a dance going on with a mountainous backdrop have both been replaced with submarines and fighter jets. I'm not really certain why this kind of change would have been made, especially considering all the other backgrounds were left untouched between the two. In fact, that's something I've always enjoyed about the original Tetris games, is that their presentation is steeped in Russian culture. Since the game itself is so simple, it becomes a perfect canvas for being able to expose other cultures to the kinds of art and music present in that part of the world. I'm not sure how well this pertains to more modern versions of Tetris, but it's something I hope hasn't been completely lost. Now for some programmer talk, because I have an unusual opinion about making Tetris clones, which actually a lot of other programmers don't share, but I think it's one that's pertinent, and I now have a chance to explain it. To put it simply, Tetris should never be a brand new coder's first game, but it's okay if it's their second or third. So now to explain this weird viewpoint. Quite frequently in the past, when I read forum posts by people just getting into the game development, many of them thought Tetris was a good starting point for learning to make games, so they'd try to make Tetris as their first game. The trouble is that despite the simplicity behind Tetris, it requires a couple intermediate game coding techniques to make it work. Multi-dimensional arrays and grid-based collision logic. To make a proper Tetris clone, you need to be able to work with arrays, which are essentially lists of values, each tied to a numerical index value. But in the case of Tetris, you're actually tracking the state of a grid of tiles, so you actually need a two-dimensional array to track this for both the x and y axes. Now, you could, in theory, just multiply one of those coordinates by a particular value and store two-dimensional contents in a one-dimensional array, but it's not quite as convenient an approach, and still requires the programmer to understand how to make arrays work in this manner, which a brand new game coder likely isn't going to understand how to do. As for grid-based collisions, Tetris's collision logic may seem incredibly simple, but there's a lot of potential oversights. For instance, when you rotate a piece, you have to make sure the new rotation will fit where you want to put it. Or when you want to slide a piece, you not only have to check to make sure one part of the piece can slide, you have to check to make sure all parts of the piece can slide. And these collision scenarios aren't necessarily going to be easy to figure out how to do, given the number of coordinate transformations necessary to pull them off. No, it's not nearly as complicated as if you were doing a full-fledged modern 3D game, far from it. But for a brand new programmer, it may be a bit overdoing it compared to simply checking if a point is inside a bounding box, which is what you would do for a low-end 2D shooter. So yeah, for these reasons specifically, anytime anyone ever says they want to try to clone Tetris for their first programming project, I discourage it, and recommend even simpler things, such as 2D shooters, breakout clones, or even board game conversions. This way, the programmer can get an idea regarding how to do all the most basic stuff when creating a game. That way, when they feel they're ready, they can move on to the more intermediate game programming paradigms without having to struggle with the basic ones at the same time. Well. That's Tetris, or more specifically, the version of Tetris I had access to growing up. Since pretty much everyone watching this video has likely played a version of Tetris at some point or another, 
I don't think I have to say that this is one of the most brilliant and yet most basic designs for a game ever conceived. But that in and of itself is also the crux of its existence. It's been copied so many times, and so many people know about it, and it's so old an idea that people generally don't talk about it anymore. It's just sort of something that exists. But it's more than that, and I wanted to present my thoughts about it and showcase some of the things I've noticed over the years, which not everyone may have been aware of. And to that end, I hope everyone watching learned something about Tetris that they never knew about prior. To set up this particular version of Tetris and DOSBox, you need to set a fixed cycles count of about 300 to get level speeds about on par with what you would have seen on systems of the time. The game does have speed auto detection in place, but it doesn't compensate very well and faster systems will still run the game faster than it's supposed to go. Anywho, that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. Episode 194 will be on Saturday, August 6th, and I'll be taking a look at the sequel to a game that I've already covered. One which was completely inundated with bugs when it was first released and wasn't made that much better with patches. If you think you know which game that could be, then be sure to send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com and stay tuned to be surprised at just how bad this next game truly is. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys.